Good evening, everyone. Welcome. Uh, for those of you who haven't met me, I'm Peter Miller, the Arts Director of the Academy, and tonight it's my pleasure to introduce uh, Annalisa Metta, the recipient of the Enel Italian uh, Fellowship in Architecture and Landscape Architecture at the American Academy in Rome. This, in fact, is the inaugural year uh, of a five-year partnership with Enel Foundation, uh, the research arm of uh, Enel, the Rome-based multinational energy group, uh, who will support one three-month Italian fellowship in architecture, landscape architecture, and urban design over the next uh, five years. So we're especially thrilled that Annalisa is our first NL fellow. Uh, Annalisa is a trained architect, and she received her PhD in uh, parks and garden design and regional planning from the University of Reggio Calabria and the Università Federico II in Naples in 2008. Uh, she's currently assistant professor in landscape architecture at the Department of Architecture at the Università Roma Tre, where she teaches both undergraduate and graduate courses in the landscape of the contemporary city and territory studies and environmental humanities. She's also taught landscape architecture at several universities in Italy and abroad, uh, including the University of Pennsylvania, the Escola Tecnica Superior d'Architettura in Barcelona, and the École Nationale Supérieure du Paysage de Versailles, uh, Marseille, Marseille. In fact, in 2014, her teaching uh, was, uh, the quality of her teaching was recognized with a special award given at the 8th International Landscape Bi Biennial in Barcelona, one of only five awards uh, given to teachers uh, from a pool made up uh, of those from over 700 uh, member schools. In addition to her stellar teaching, Annalise has been involved in a wide range of research and curatorial projects. Uh, she's one of the founders and partners of Osa Arquitectura and Paisaggio, a Rome-based uh, design uh, studio. And in addition to their design uh, of a series of uh, architectural and landscape projects, both built uh, and unbuilt, uh, Osa was the curator, and Annalise was fundamental to that project, uh, the curator and the designer of the section Bosco Italia uh, for the Italian Pavilion at the 13th Biennial for Architecture in Venice in 2012. Uh, Annalise is also a member of uh, L LUC, LUC, I don't know how to, uh, Living Urban Space, a national research project uh, funded by the Italian Ministry of Education. In 2014, Annalise curated the exhibition Anna and Lawrence Halprin, Paisaggi e Coreografia del Quotidiano, uh, commissioned by the Casa dell'Architettura in Rome in collaboration with several other institutions, including the Italian National Council of Architects, uh, the Bruno Zevi Foundation, and the Jewish Museum in Rome. She has published widely in specialized books and reviews, and just a couple of examples. Her books include Città Pubblica, uh, Paisaggi Comuni, published by Gengemi Editori in 2013, and Paisaggi d'Autore, Il Novecento in 120 Progetti, uh, published in 2008. During her time at the Academy, Annalisa is working on a project uh, uh, that explores the effects of global warming, uh, the effects of which will gradually create climactic conditions, or so projections suggest, in Rome similar to those in Tunis. Uh, she is interested in how the accretion of subtle uh, environmental changes brought on by climactic shifts will shape the urban landscape in Rome. A reflection uh, on these issues and how the architecture of behavior and, and that of uh, intangible materials, even weather, uh, can work to restore what she calls enchantment to public space in the contemporary city. Annalisa's talk tonight is entitled A Matter of Bodies an atmosphere. Please welcome Annalisa. Good evening to you all and uh, thanks for being here and thanks to Peter for this very kind presentation. And thanks for this uh, opportunity to share works uh, and ideas. And then sorry <laughs> for my very your indulgence and thanks to Danny who very kindly helped me. 
um, as a scholar as well as a designer, I deal with contemporary urban space and mainly with ephemeral design. My topic today is about this at the meeting point of two fieldworks. One is about how the presence of bodies and actions of people can shape and inspire urban space design. The other is how intangible materials, the most connected to what we call weather, can actually mold space. Edouard Manet said more and better. A few people gathered can give shape and meaning to a place, even so far from the expected one. Then their bodies capture temperature, perhaps seasons, the material landscape we cannot see, just feel. So it's a matter of bodies and atmosphere, an architecture of almost nothing, I should say. I will show you some previous works of mine, and then I'll tell you what is currently on my table, better on my walls, here at the Academy. Let's go to contemporary city and start with some recent events. 2010, Berlin. The Temple of Airport closed in 2008, and a contest then won by Grossmax was carried out to turn it into a park. In the meantime, pending the design advancement, the mayor took the decision, in appearance innocuous, to open the gates and make the site entirely available for people. Slowly, Berliners began to attend the place for leisure time. The airstrips, the signage, everything remained as it was, you can see. The site did not change physically, but it was transformed by the unpredictable ways to inhabit it, by the people's presence, actions and bodies. In 2014, with a referendum, Berliners obtained that no transformation will ever be implemented and the park will continue to be just what it already was. 2011, Cairo. Without any quality in architecture, Tahrir Square is now perhaps the most emblematic place of the capital city. The actual presence of people literally rearranged this place in one of the most outstanding mass events of our recent history. Its architectural meaning has been largely underestimated, I think. When the asphalt of the square was still warm because of the crow, the Icar Gallery launched a contest to renew Tahrir Square, ignoring what the place was saying. The practice of living can give quality to public space in forms that even transcend the architectural matter of space. 2012, Venice. Gateway is the exhibition edited by Norman Foster for the 13th Biennale of Architecture. On the walls of the darkened room, images of tiny action just outside the doorstep, as well great collective, religious, sports or political rituals displayed the configurative role of behaviors. It struck me a lot, not only for the message, of course, but also because the author, Foster, accustomed us to solemn architectures as super design objects, he played, and still mostly plays, you know, as a so-called archistar, and then instead seemed to take a step back and admit that life between buildings is much more attractive than any combination of architectural ideas. If three clues are in evidence, these events can feed the opportunity to assume people bodies as tools of knowledge, activation, and configuration of urban spaces. This is what I mean with architecture of behavior. It moves public space design from the worn hub of morphology and language or even style toward the ways of living as the matrix at, at the same time the ethical and aesthetical purpose of the project. Some architects, urban planners and <coughs> landscape architects deeply explored this field in the 60s and 70s. Less known than they should be, at, at least in Italy, William White, while working with the New York City Planning Commission, began to wonder how newly planned city spaces were actually working out. This curiosity led to the Street Life Project, a pioneering study of pedestrian behavior and city dynamics. He mounted a time-lapse camera overlooking some topical public space in New York and recorded the daily patterns. What I considered so inspiring in White's work is that he had the courage to investigate the limits of obviousness offering so refined interpretation of everyday, banal, ordinary, mundane realm. 
is shooting and words about people balancing their bodies while chatting on the few steps to enter Poly Park moved me every time. In the same years, Lawrence and Anna Alperin, one landscape architect, the latter a dancer and choreographer, were working together. Here you can see some pictures taken from the exhibition Learning from Mrs. and Mr. Alperin, Choreography of Everyday Life, I concede for Casa dell'Architettura of Rome, the first exhibition I never held in Europe about this extraordinary couple of artists. The Alperin worked on the role of the body to shape spaces with the projects that are among the cornerstones of the 20th century landscape architecture, as it is the portal sequence of spaces culminating in the Aira Fontaine, a manifesto with the idea that city is a dynamic field activated by the daily practices. According to them, every human action can be seen as choreography, intentional as well unaware, and design can imagine and offer public space as the place where many choreographies, spontaneous as well obliged, set up as well unruly, can coexist always overlapping and interfering easily and gently. Likewise, in Europe, in Amsterdam, destroyed by the World War II, Alde Van Eyck reclaimed many bombed lots as playgrounds, places to the utmost of interaction and bodies. Very simple furniture dotted empty spaces, calling people, not only children, to meet again a few steps from their houses and retake possession of the city. By celebrating the physical reappropriation of the common urban space, his work opened the long European peace. After a completely different war in the 70 Italy, the so-called Anni di Piombo, with the Stade Romana, Renato Nicolini brought people back into the street, going beyond collective fear about terrorism, just working with ephemeral design and a so rich schedule of happenings, performance and art events. Being there, just lingering in the public space, staking our own right to inhabit the city with our own body, just there together, has been one of the most impressive and effective opposition to violence, perhaps more compelling and effectual than any other political measure. But these positions were quite isolated. In the second half of the 20th century, of course in Europe, urban politics have worked for the actual removal of people from the urban space. It happened by apparently tiny but crucial actions. Fences around the parks, residential enclave without any common venue, city rules which declare dangerous gathering on the sidewalk and thus require new buildings to have no shops on the street, as it just happening in some new district in Paris, for example. So we inherited the idea that cities should be safe through control and loneliness and separation. Removing people means removing conflicts, of course, but means also removing life. With the last passage of the century, a clear change occurred. The real novelty of Puerto del Sol, Taksim and Tahrir Square, for example, was exactly in the way they renew relations between bodies and urban spaces. Their subversive value was their creative use of urban space. They were not illegal, they were just creative. That is unexpected and surprising and so cutting edge. The most innocuous action, dancing on the street, for example, took a revolutionary value because beyond any functional or productive logic, using nothing but their bodies, people realized space situations that were, at the same time, protest and proposal. All this really deals very closely with the contemporary design culture. As an evidence, the 2014 edition of the European Prize for Urban Public Space, one of the most authoritative awards for public space implementation in Europe, set up in 1999 by the Center for Contemporary Culture in Barcelona, had occupied Gezi among the finalists, after having assigned a special mention two years before to the Campada del Puerto del Sol in Madrid. Meaningfully, an architecture prize whose remaining awards are only for permanent and firm design, was instead attributed to people occupations and collective rituals. This event and the three clues that opened my talk suggest that these achievements are nourishing public space design all over the world, often imbued with a playful and cheerful attitude. Especially, I dare enough to share you <laughs> with you some works of mine engaged with this topic. They are all ephemeral, all self-built and extremely low budget, sometimes connected with didactic workshop or urban art festival or local association commitment. I'll show you some of them using we pronoun, 
because they are teamwork. I shared with my partner in life and work, Luca Catalano, with the other designers of our firm, OZA, and many other wonderful professionals. You will read on my slides and to whom I dedicate this shop talk. We cannot separate the idea of an inhabited place from the actual presence of bodies. To have it recalls and required people being there, bringing there their own steps, lingering, adapting themselves to the place, and conversely, adapting the place to their own practical as well poetic needs. For extension, the same idea of citizenship is the right to stay in a public space together, each with own specificity and identity. And it can happen, as a designer, to be asked to work in a place to restore a certain idea of belonging and dignity. And so the aim of design is make people say, yes, this is our place. Nothing more, nothing less than this. Valle of Radiant Progress was a workshop for Eco Week, an international non-profit program which every year in a different European city gathers designers and students on issues of sustainable urban design. We worked in Borghetto Valle Aurelia in Rome, once called Hill Valley, by the presence till the early 20th century of many smoking brick kilns to nourish the first building of the post unification capital city. The Borghetto, very close to Vatican City, also the workers and their families in self-built little and poor buildings, and in few decades got gradually, even unlawfully, denser. Meanwhile, a strong sense of belonging got steady in the community. In the 70s, the hardship in housing conditions became an emergency. In spite of intense protest, in 1981 summer, the Borghetto was demolished, relocating the residents by force and against their will in new public houses built very close to the village. Any rehabilitation and retraining never followed demolitions. This is still today an unsolved area with interrupted history. Most of the inhabitants now living in the public houses keep alive the memory of the violent dismantling and see in the abandoned lots among the few buildings still there for the strong defense of the inhabitants, the ghost of the vitality of the past. This was the starting point of our work, transforming the empty lots into opportunity for new common life through a temporary urban action entirely self-financed and self-built in five days with 12 students from five different countries. Very punctual operation aimed to a very simple goal, bringing people back into the village. We arranged one of the lots as a prototype of the opportunities of the many and user open space of Borghetto. Just very small things. Add stairs for a direct connection with the street. Set some furniture very simple to sit and rest and also to play. And cut the grass to reveal a secret mini soccer field. A painting graphic code on the road linked the Borghetto with the public houses and is the track of a joyful musical, Pasacalle, an exhibition of photographs collected from the same inhabitants who kindly accepted to share their own and private memory told the Borghetto and its history with the disruptive effect of recreating the community. Everyone was looking for his or an own place, the one they lived in or just loved, the people they knew and loved too. This is the first of a series of works in Potenza in South Italy. Here you can see the most impressive public housing settlement standing since 1973 on a ridge in the outskirts of the city. It's a half a kilometer building, 40 meter high, with another one very similar but shorter facing the other side of the road. In 1998, the Spanish architect Eric Miralles was entrusted with a new public space to reclaim the place and he turned the district's widest street in a multi-purpose building with a roof garden on the top. The building, soon named the ship by local, local people because of the shape and the size, had never been open. Most of the inhabitants had never set foot on the roof garden before our action in September 2014 as a sign of absolute condemn. The reasons for this failure are only marginally architectural. It is a firm project of recognizable quality, but unable to get in tune with the place, deaf to the real roots of the inhabitants' discomfort. The right answer to the wrong question, I can say. Asked to redesign the place, we realized that a changing in perception and feeling could be more effective than any new design. 
The architecture was already there and after all was good. It was more a matter of falling in love with the place, a bet on the enchantment. We work on almost nothing. The first thing was the immediate adoption of the roof garden. Nothing but just being there every day, giving evidence to the possibility to inhabit the ship and its garden just as they were. We started to play there, have picnic, even write on walls, take rest and sunbat, and this came to be so strange for local people and almost revolutionary. Then we realized micro places with basic gardening and adding handcrafted furniture for playing and resting. And the second track was trying to overturn the negative meaning of the ship. Then it came the idea of the paper boat, a playful and familiar object able to miniaturize and disarm the ship just with a bit of irony. The building became a paper boat lab with an heterogeneous community of students, residents, administrators, curious passersby. In a week, we produced a fleet of 10,000 boats. And <laughs> And boat after boat, according with the relaxing rhythm of this repetitive folding, you know, people spoke together, joining ideas, complaints, of course, but also desires and proposals. Finally, the boats invaded the garden, braving the wind of a September Sunday, arriving from the streets, from the housing stairways, surprising with their unusual presence, covering the ground and the playground, Suspended, a little crooked, skewered on sticks in the middle as strange flowers, the boots market pads, leading to garden places we just named. On the last day, the ship hold, never used before, opened its load of pictures from the district we prepared as the first exhibition of an art center. Since then, many activities have continued to oversee the garden and the building, continuing to cultivate what has been seeded in a few days. Stating that behaviors arranged or are foreseen could shape urban space design can mean, perhaps, that we are in a new era of functionalism. But unlike the modernist 20th century model, it now works through deliberately inexact structures. I mean coexistence, able to host the gathering of different bodies, behaviors, spaces, times and cultures, through exchange, joining, inserting, and layering heterogeneous wellness, activities, and expression, sometimes even incoherently. And so, deliberately inexact structure are architecture for opportunities, invention, creative common life. Again in Potenza, we were asked to celebrate the city tradition of night bonfires, translating this ritual from the main public space of the city to the service area of an abandoned dairy farm. The aim was to turn the derelict plot into an enchanted place, so nourishing people's awareness of the opportunity left idle in many forgotten places. Fanoi was a one-night fire garden. We used almost 4,000 green and white candles to create a pattern inspired by Villa Lantin, one of the landscape architecture's most important icons. Garden, you know, is a place of care and preciousness, so turning a derelict farm into a garden, in this case of fire, means to give it the presence and the role of an eminent place for quality and value. We prepare the layout during the day, you can see in this picture, and then um, after the sunset, Visitors lit the candles in the ensemble, slowly rendering the shape of the garden visible by night. Here you can see some pictures that are showing how people, step by step, candle by candle, was able to give evidence to the garden and uh, making it visible during the night. Then something happened. People began to move the candles creating completely new layout. And uh, in this way, people's behavior came to be a form of creativity applied to the designer's work, quite like what happens between performer and composer of a music piece or a choreography. We use the Villa Lante pattern, not only because it's one of the landscape architecture's most important historical sites, of course, 
but also because it represents the icon of a formal garden, static, still, just to be admired, a place of representation, not a place for real life and its many imperfections. By contrast, we consider the pattern a deliberately inexact structure and allow people to transform and redesign the layout in such a desecrating action, admitting life and its imperfections. This project is also in potenza for the 2016 edition of the Città delle Cento Scale Urban Art Festival. They give us a keyword, the Italian in debito, that is undue and underserved, but also in debt. And assigned one of the hundreds public stairs dotting Potenza because of its topography. Stairs are very intriguing places. They are inevitably pedestrian areas, and a so huge equipment of places without cars makes Potenza a no doubt a special city. But actually, stairs are quite deserted because of the strain, the gravity, you know because nothing interesting happened there, and most of the entryways to the buildings phase away. So we wondered how amazing the stairs could be if they were other and more than just stairs. What if they were also squares, gardens, playgrounds, markets, and so on, all climbing? According to the keyword, we imagine an undue and underserved appropriation of the stairs by other more popular open spaces. And so, in a few days, the Parterba de l'Orangerie of Versailles came to Potenza. Here you can see the plan. The Parterre, a par excellence plain device, was broken down in 120 strips, as many as the steps. From the bottom, you could not recognize the layout and you had to go upstairs to finally see the entire pattern, as you can see here. So, this is no more a star. Another rapporteur, it's a new hybrid space born by coexistence and mixing. In this image, you can see a photograph taken from above during the night. We copied a well known garden according to the other meaning of the keyword to be in debt. To copy always means to owe something to someone. It's a strategy of genetic evolution, it's the way DNA multiplies. It's a strategy of cultural development when you glean ideas from others to improve and go on. In both cases, the most surprising achievement comes from inexact copies, able to produce varying and novelty. In this sense, debt is the most cogent formula of life in its collective and joined format. These pictures show different moments of our ephemeral garden. During the night, we arranged a dotting choreography of starlight. Someone thought they were special flowers and collected an unusual bouquet. I loved it, definitely. Then, during the day, people performed their own choreography following the André Lenotre footpath, so not walking just on a straight line in a usually absent-minded way, but changing direction almost every step often having to choose between two alternative checks uh, and so needing awareness of their own body. Some chairs allow people to have a rest in the stream to go up. They were arranged in small convivial group just on the step and not on the landing, exactly to stress on the idea that the stairs could be attended and comfortable. Other chairs instead kept all their legs in one piece to allow people to move them and choose their favorite position to stay alone or join friends. Comfort in public space is typically purged of political significance and reduced in the seemingly inoffensive field of furniture design. On the contrary, it has great political implications, enabling or conversely restricting an individual and collective behaviors. We could talk about political ergonomics. By the way of comfort, going back to William White, a chapter of his 1980 book, The Social Life of Small Urban Spaces, is just dedicated to explore the relation among space, weather, microclimate, and people behavior, looking at that connection between the physical consistence of places, people, and intangible matters. Looking back also to Alprin's work, we can mention their workshop, Experiments in the Environment, which stimulated students, an assorted group of architects, musicians, dancers, visual artists, to the sensitive understanding of places, 
blindfolded to focus on what is not visible, but equally crucial for the landscape quality, the warmth on the hair or the background noise, for example, and on actual experience with the site as a tool of knowledge and imagination, with such an empathy reminding me of the Edouard Manet Désigné we saw before. An outstanding example of William White and Lawrence Sarprin show how finally it's almost impossible to separate the concern with the people behavior from the attention to weather and the intangible matters of architecture. They are all ephemeral, <coughs> evanescent, vague, impalpable and volatile, so weak in their material concreteness and physical weight, so strong in molding space. The atmosphere is increasingly getting a central topic for urban space design, as Mirko Zardini claims uh, with an exhibition, Sense of the City, at the Montreal CCA in 2005. Challenging the dominance of vision, Sense of the City proposes a new approach, a sensorial urbanism whose aim is to analyze urban phenomena in terms of luminosity and darkness, seasons and climate, the smell of the hair, the material surfaces of the city, and sounds. These are some pictures from the exhibition. Inspired by the reprisal of many of the 60s and 70s counter-movements in architecture, Sense of the City reframes discussion in terms of nocturnal city, seasonal city, sound, surface and air of the city, focusing on senses as the important keys to explore urban life. In recent years, we are testifying in architecture and urbanism a rediscovery of the element of character. Associated with a particular place, the term character indicates its specificity, embracing all the various sensory experiences that one can have in a place. As far back as the end of the 70s, Kevin Lynch and Christian Norberg Schulz reintroduced this topic into their reflection on the urban environment. In particular, the latter described places as a total qualitative phenomenon, making use of expression like environmental character and atmosphere, indeed. More recently, in 2006, Peter Zunter defined his design attitude as the search for the magic of things, the magic of the real world. What def definitively seduced me is just this double value of sense. It is feeling, as well, it is meaning. And so, what is the sense of the place? Its deep meaning, its essence, its character. And perhaps, can we capture the meaning through sensitiveness and so through feeling? The seduction of place, the enchantment of place, still exists and habits the intangible as well actual realm. Bosco Italia was part of the Italian pavilion for the 13th Architectural Biennale in Venice and reproduced for three months an indoor Italian underwood. The general topic was the architecture of production and we choose the wood exactly because it's so close connected with productive landscape. More than 90% of Italian land has a forestry vocation. Without human work, in a few time it would turn into a wood in all its different kinds. Today forest enlargement has reached a peak. Italian wooded surface is about 11 million hectares that is 35% of the full Italian territory, meaning a strong reduction of cultivated lands. This data inquire about the real character of Italian landscape. What is it? Swinging between the sunny garden of Europe of traditional literature and the dark Mediterranean wood of actual economy and ecology. And so we decided to present Italy on the worldwide set as an underwood a topos usually connected to the imaginary of northern European countries and instead so close to us. The pavilion at Legagendre was perfect for our intention to evoke the atmosphere of a dark and cool brushwood. It has just three skylights filtering inside the Venice light that is diffuse and cold. Venice architects never draw shadow, you know. While here in Rome we are always armed with charcoal to underline contrast, Drawing attitude is a matter of weather, what else? The skylights worked as spotlight in a wood clearing and we worked with light to arrange the selection and position of plants according with the shade of cones. We use asparagus and liriope for the brightest part and then ruscus, a collection of five different fern and ederiberica for the darkest places. 
In these pictures you can see the result. The light is diffused, also working, wor working on the wall surface are reflecting Venice Tuckel. The air is moist, also thanks to the sprinkling irrigation as a light rain. Leaves sometimes whisper by a slight wind entering into the building. The smells are those of moist soil. All around is a collection of different shades of green, bright as well deep. I can say that arriving there in a hot day after the long crossing of the Vuller Senale was surprising but also comfortable in feeling and in meaning. Some years ago we were invited to realize a temporary garden for three days for the first edition of the garden festival Giardini Terrazza on the terraces of the Auditorium of Rome. In a so iconic place, we imagined a white fence to create a sort of a wardrobe room not competitive with the so bold architecture around. You can see there our box. <laughs> we built it with wooden boxes, the one used for fruits, tied together and then painted with white lime. The result from outside was that of a compact and natural box, and once inside, you discovered hundreds of lobelia rhinos covering the entire walls while walking on the sky mirrored on the ground. The inside space is a tribute to Rome at the beginning of the 18th century when they used to paint facade of a pale light of blue, the color of sky, color dell'aere, so that the heavy buildings and intangible air became a wall. The garden is a sky room once inside, the sky is over your head, walls are fully covered by little blue flowers around you. Under your feet again the sky and the flowers blending and merging with you in the mirror. The idea of a wandering space is once more a tribute to late Baroque Rome, made with common materials as wooden boxes and very ordinary vegetation. Here I was cleaning the sky and preventing clouds, probably. Inside the temperature was very hot, just cooler close to the wall because of the humidity of plants and the soil, you can imagine. The light was so bright, a sort of hyper atmosphere of Rome, just con condensed in a wooden box. But this work tried to deal with the specificity of places, connected with atmosphere and body, in terms of presence and sensitiveness, and are in such a way bonded with my current work here at the American Academy, to which I'll dedicate this final part of my talk. This is the title, Southward, when Roma will go to Tunis. I'm setting up a portrait of a future and hotter Rome, according with the global warming scenario landed up by scientists. Scientific climate models predict a shift over the coming decades that effectively will shift southward the meteorological latitude of the cities. Paris will migrate to Toulouse, London to Bordeaux, and Rome will replace Tunis. How then will the urban landscape change? The first aim of my work is to deal with climate changing as a cultural agency. Climate changing is under the lens of several disciplines, most of them rely with ecology and environmental studies, but only few look at climate changing in terms of identity of places. I'm trying to assume the point of view of a landscape and not just of environment, involving the complex and entailed topics connected with the sense of a place, with identity and memory, permanence and changing, more than just ecology, economy, and survival. The second aim is to avoid abstraction and go through actual experience of places. While global warming poses an essential trial to the future, for most the trial is largely abstractly imagined. Numbers, indicators, and charts, as well as worst-casting scenery of flooding or food shortage, as well also the so-called climate art, you know, imbued by high-tech devices, are all abstract narrative, I think, 
so far from the common experience of planes. On the contrary, climate changing really happens every day through actual, tangible, although subtle disturbances to the status quo. So what will happen if from average temperature became three or four either degree? What will happen to its light, to the clarity of its horizon, to the sharpness of its shadow, also crucial for its architecture? How will local vegetation, their palette of colors and texture, life cycles, their interplay with wind and rain change? What will happen to people, to the social rituals, to the habits and the open-air and aware choreography fostered by room always mild temperature? I'm proposing the narrative of a dislocation, that of Rome moving southward, going to Tunis, in a sort of travel diary, through a collection of pictures focusing on fragments of seemingly mundane events and phenomena. They are what you are just seeing in these slides. It's a sort of atlas of accidental pictures, I can say so. You can find there are some recurrent obsessions I have, that for materials and the tactile perception of places, wondering about the new surfaces, the new skin of the city. That for the contest between light and shadow, where contrasts sometimes are so bold, sometimes disappear because of too much light. For the new planting vocabulary and advance of plants and animal seasonal phenology, giving new colors, but also new life cycles to the living city for the thickness and the weight of the air and the rain, with dust and sand coming from the desert and pollution. That for people, yes, and there are different ways to give sense and form to the space, just with their bare presence or with their absence. The absence of people changes the color, the shape, the sound of the places we know. But finally, pictures are not selected, arranged or classified following, we, uh, following a sequence of memory of topics or storytelling. This is the actual situation of my studio here. The collection doesn't aim to coherence or completeness. It doesn't try to excessively explore the issue. It does not produce hierarchies or categories, but creates relations. And so the collection is open, really, but there are connections among the fragments fragments of a personal situation and objects that come to be embraceable, I hope. Many photographs are really ordinary, and so they speak of the experience of everyone. I'm not a photographer, of course, and if considered one by one, most of these pictures are banal, rough, even shoddy or mediocre. They could perhaps be meaningful just because of a narrative and an em em emotive as well as sensitive engagement. This is a narrative of dislocation. Some pictures are without any counterfeit, they are just what they are. Others are even evilly tempered with by me. I will never reveal anything about <laughs> to, <laughs> to leave discernment, just to experience a wealthy imagination. I'm deliberately looking for doubt and eventuality. This is my car after a sand store a sandstorm in Rome, and is absolutely true, I swear. So some pictures are real, others are fake. It's a matter of getting lost and then be again safe, to know well where we are and then be confused and unsure. It happens with space but also with time. When did I take this photograph? Perhaps today, perhaps in the future? What really matters is perhaps the months more than the year. For example, this was the statue, November or perhaps February, I'm not, not so sure. One of those little rain airplanes had just passed through over my head. It had silver iodide on the wings, you know, very useful to make clouds rain, and it had been so dry. It already happened quite often, the airplane arrived and then it rained, backlit, softly, I can say. Instead, I'm sure I took this photograph in January. I can remember very well because it was my 50th birthday. Rome was full of tourists. Winter was, even then, the high season for tourism. 
Here some girls were sitting on the steps of San Carlo e Catinari and I love their sandals. And this is one of the oldest and most beloved photos of mine. A long, long time ago. <laughs> um, it was the 20th of November, it was Sunday. It was a branch on terrace of the American Academy. How funny and how hot it was. And these are some part of the, my collection. It's a sort of open-ended chronology, I can say. It's current, but also expanded in the past time, and, but also in the future, I really can say. And also in this sense, I hope it will work as a trip. Wandering among the pictures is a journey in time and in space, here and elsewhere, today and tomorrow meant together. On one end, it's memory. On the other, projection. Ambiguity is the goal, working on a fine line. In such a way, observing is already designing. When I started my experience here, I was sure I'd have, have worked out a design. I'm a designer, so yes, what else? But then I understood that I was dealing with a travel, and what seemed to be more exciting was not the arrival, but the journey itself. It was also because of your help from Peter, who introduced me to the wonderful world of fragments and tiny things of Tombly, very inspiring for me, to Jonathan, who taught me how to see the places I was hearing, and a special thanks to Gustave Flaubert. I met him in the library. He made this trip before us. He, go to, he went to Tunis before me, and he left for Egypt and then Tunis with the idea to write a book. But something happened, and so the, he wrote to his very close friend, Louis Bouillet, and he said, the first day I had been writing a bit, but uh, thank God I soon realized the futility. It's better to be an I, simply. And that's it. So it uh, depends from the different places, uh, because for example, in the case of the dairy farm, it was just an um, impromptu action. Uh, it was almost illegal, because it's a private pro pro property, and so we have just the time of a day. It was a garden for just a day, for just a night, and so I think that uh, everything handed there. But it was very, very um, uh, bold for the effort of, of on people. I was there, and people was calling, were, were calling to other, please come here, you can't imagine what is happening. And so also the fact that people was going there means to discover a part of the city that they never knew. It's a completely different um, situation in, instead for the case of um, the ship because uh, uh, there we were able also, I have to say, for the um, great work of my colleagues in, uh, in Potenza, to nourish uh, a continuing relation with inhabitants. And so, for example, they um, uh, organize a, a group of uh, workers in the gardens for maintaining the um, very little and poor uh, furniture we built are still there. Um, uh, the, um, the health instead, the inside part of the building, worked for just a year, and so they realized their um, festival of cinema, of dance, but um, it was more complicated because the garden is open, you know, and the center building has to be open, and so now the situation is not so good. 
and uh, instead for the last situation that is one of the garden on uh, on the stairs the climbing garden it was very very funny because uh, uh, it's very recent so i really can't say enough about it but uh, it uh, lasts there for two two weeks and people say oh it's um, uh, money and the work that uh, you you do just away why make a garden of uh, just um, two weeks and other people instead was there and was saying, uh, I made it differently, I made this chair here, or perhaps we can make this in the other part. And it was extraordinary because people were designing. They like or they don't like, but they were designing. And so it's important for me to work in this way because it's more effective than any drawing, at the, uh, any um, briefing, because the place is just there, the space is there, and people can deal with it directly. And so in this case, I can see really, but for example, uh, now we are starting to think of a strategy that could work on, also on the other stairs. And so I'm optimist, and I think that something could work on. Yes, I can say that no, I'm not working on this, but of course it could be a wonderful advice to work on this, di on this direction. Uh, because I think that this very tiny condition uh, is uh, a method of work, and so you can apply it for the situation we have seen, but also for this kind of very huge problem that at the end became a small problem when you can consider it in your um, everyday sphere of, of, of work. Uh, really, as I said before, um, I'm not imagining a design, so a proposal, or, or um, give some guidelines to solve this problem. But I think what is very important is to be aware of this little dimension of the problem. And so that what is happening is not a, a global problem to be solved with a global solution, but that deals with your everyday life. And so perhaps we can go in the direction we are speaking about, but this for me here is just the beginning and the first step, or perhaps a path that could go there. So thank you for this suggestion. <laughs> Mm, 
I'm not so sure to ever exactly understand your question, but are you asking me if there is a sort of logic of um, um, disappearing of a structure also in the case? Okay. Yeah, it it, in, it 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 could be, it could be from the point of view of approach of attitude to the to, to the topic. I think, and this is also the reason I don't want to deal with a huge image of Rome, but to work with fragments, and so this idea of dissolution of speaking of very single piece that at the end you can collect and you can rearrange in a order, in a structure that is inexact and you can recompose as, as you want, is exactly the way I, I, I'm working on. Uh, because at the beginning, when I arrived here, I'd like to make a design for a space, for a particular space, and at the end, instead, I decided to work on, on the, just the little parts of the structure, and then you can decide how to arrange it, and so perhaps it could disappear or, uh, or not. And um, this is a very important topic, for example, for me in this moment, so, about how to arrange my collection. Uh, because it could be, um, I don't know really, if to arrange a fixed situation when you have the images in a certain order, and so do you have a narrative, or perhaps, and this is what I, I'd prefer really, to leave images to, to, to move. And so you can also imagine to rearrange it, and so it is an exact uh, and uh, moving structure itself. Yes, also in this case, I hope to have a really understand your question. Um, perhaps I think that uh, is a, a, a matter of approach and attitude, because you can imagine to work everything as uh, in exact structures, and so to leave people to be part of a design, and to be part of a design it needs awareness, because if you are acting, if you are making something, you know what you are dealing with. And so I think that, uh, of course, we can work in this direction. And so it's not just a matter of typology of design. And so I work on the femoral, I work on very little things. But I can say that this kind of attitude could be applied to also very different conditions. You can apply it to a building, also, also to a part of the, of the city. Just the sign that the people have to be aware to take part to the design, but not in an abstract abstract way that is uh, part, part, part participation and all other such things that are not so useful, I think, but in an actual way. So you can just imagine to build a structure and leave that things happens. I I think so. And I I, I answer to your question. Yeah, okay. <laughs> Yeah, it's, yes. it's, 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 it's a factual matter, it's not a, a factual of, of theory, or you have to be aware and I have to teach you how to do. No, please act, please do, please live.
just um, I see the same trees, and I just wonder our authorities or uh, any institution beyond the academia actually helping try to find to because you are trying to do <coughs> you're finding a way to mm. right in between all of the different yeah. politics and maneuvers. And is there someone who supports you besides that? Yeah, it's, um, it's very difficult, very, very difficult, uh, also because uh, a cultural matter, because most of people and authorities, of course, usually thinks about these things as a joke. And so, okay, you're joking. Yes, you can make it if you want. <laughs> yeah, and um, I can say in English, but uh, in Italian, we say ludoteca, and so I'm usually always managing the ludoteca of, of of the matter. And, um, but what is really important instead is to make administration think that this is not an alternative to the usual way to design, but it's a complementary instrument. Because you can just test the city. And actually, you can understand how people accept or not it, how people behave, and how people can transform it. And so it's so useful because in a very short time, with very short money, you can really understand how, what, what to do. And so it's a very powerful instrument. And I think that really the city could understand how to use this. And it's also an historical matter. If you think of Rome, for example, the stairs of Trinta de Monti and in Piazza di Spagna, they became a, a real monument just after Bernini arranged it as an ephemeral situation. And also it happens for the Porta del Popolo. It was an ephemeral situation and then it came to be permanent. And so we forgot this lesson, I, I think. And so I think that really we can use ephemeral, not just an alternative, but an everyday tool of our way to think city. John, can you have your hand up? Just a, an observation, not a question. Uh, there was, uh, was a beautiful talk here. Thank you. Uh, I'm not sure to have understood really your question. Because it's, because it's perhaps very, I, if I understood well, it's very close to what were originally before was asked me. So how this kind of work could deal with politics and with administrations or, or not? Mm, 
It's a very difficult question, <laughs> and at the end uh, I can give a very obvious answer that is that everything is a political action. And so, for example, in our last uh, project that of the climbing uh, gardens, we use chairs as a political tools, and uh, I hope that uh, people can understand the political value of to have chairs in that way in their public spaces. And so the idea that you can use it as you want, deciding to uh, display the spaces according to your own feeling, that is a common, really, feelings. Uh, um, for example, we have an, a very funny event in uh, Italy some years ago in uh, Treviso, because uh, the mayor decided to remove all the benches because they were um, dangerous because people meet there. And so it was very dangerous that people meet. Um, and so they really removed every chair, every benches. And the day after, people, the inhabitants, got, uh, went back and they built by the service, the, the service they uh, brought chairs from their own houses and so on to have new ch benches in the city. And I think that is a political matter, of course. Upstairs, and uh, before we go, let's uh, give Anita one more hand. For <laughs>